we have the pleasure of listening to Rebecca Power. Uh, Rebecca is a water resource specialist at the University of Wisconsin Extension. She is director of the North Central Region Water Network and provides leadership for a national training program for conservation professionals. During her 13 years with the Extension, she has developed and supported successful multi-state, multidisciplinary teams to address water resource issues in the upper Midwest and created stronger linkages between the environmental and social sciences and water resource management. She began her career with a private consulting firm restoring savannas, savannah prairies, wetlands in the upper Midwest, and spent eight years with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service using adaptive management strategies in the restoration of savannah ecosystems. Quite a list of experiences. You're up. I feel like it's the prices right here, you know, coming down the aisle. Come on down. <laughs> Come on down. All right. Is this mic is the microphone working? Okay, it is. Great. Whew. All right. Good morning, everyone. Still morning, right? Okay. Um, I was hearing a little conversation over here earlier about uh, this morning's presentations, and uh, like, wow, that's a lot of information. Susan gave us a lot of amazing information. I had not been through that 101 in a while, so it was great to see that overview. I'm also going to give you a lot of information, so I'll just encourage you to, you know, I think these presentations will be available for folks afterwards. So just take what you need right now, leave what you don't. I tried to, you know, put links in so that you can refer to this information later, okay? So just take it easy, and hopefully um, you'll learn a little bit, and we can have some time for questions at the end. All right, so Susan really focused us on in-lake and then a little bit outside in the watershed and some of the things that are going on that in affect in-lake dynamics. What I'm going to do is try to expand that what's going on outside of the lake and in the watershed um, and, and how might we utilize that information and some tools that are available for what's going on in the watershed to help us manage our lakes. <clears throat> so the, um, focusing in this place where we are, uh, Stevens Point and uh, the Wisconsin River, our, um, our home watershed for this conference, and how much, of course, that we, we know that this river, um, the, the lakes along, the impoundments along the river and the places that you all work and play and live are embedded in a landscape. Um, so this is a, a bird's eye view, um, but there are a lot of lenses that we look through when it comes to managing water and loving water and living with water in Wisconsin, right? So agriculture uh, is an important part of our economy, important part of our culture here in Wisconsin, and of course affects water um, and, and utilizes water. Who could forget the the great water in the bottle and how we, how we transform that into something uh, even more delicious than, than plain water uh, can be. Um, we use it for power generation, uh, for, of course, swimming and relaxing along our beaches. Uh, we've talked about fishing uh, quite a bit. Let's see who can get the best fish, fish picture in our presentations. Just, just the beauty uh, of the water, uh, the lakes that we love and the places that we love that have water. And then the spiritual value um, that many of us place on water resources, whatever your uh, religious or spiritual tradition. It's an important part of why we love and value water resources. So I'm just doing that linking land and water. Uh, uh, Luna Leopold's uh, son of Ella Leopold waters the most critical issue of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. The health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. Again, recognizing this um, interconnection between water and the land, and that how we live on the land really is always uh, reflected in, in what we're seeing in our lakes and our rivers and our wetlands. So um, we've seen a lot of technical information already in this conference. Does, you don't have to be super technical to understand right, how this flow of water works and, and the water cycle. Um, let's see, is there a, yeah. This is Rib Mountain right here. Just pretend it's Rib, I know it doesn't look, really look like Wisconsin. Um, so, so yeah, I think you, how many people are not familiar with the water cycle, right? We've already, we've been through that. Okay, good, you guys know this. So. Um, 
Just a little Wisconsin by the numbers, this place that we're in. You know, we've got uh, over 15,000 lakes, uh, over 1.2 million acres of Wisconsin is covered by water, over 1,000 shoreland miles, uh, and, the, and uh, coastal beach miles in the Great Lakes, 192, rivers and stream miles, 88,000, wetland acres, 5 million, um, and then groundwater, 1.2 quadrillion gallons. I have no idea how much that actually is. I can't translate that for you, but it's a lot, right? We've got a lot of water above ground and below ground in Wisconsin. And then, of course, our, our, the population of people that, that care about those water resources. So what's the condition of our water overall here in Wisconsin? You know a lot about the lakes that you particularly live on and, and um, uh, work with and support. Here's a little bit about just generally where we are in the state. And, and I've, got, I've got two years of the Wisconsin DNR water quality reports to Congress reflected here, just to show you that there's a difference between years. So, I mean, it, these numbers change a little bit over time, depending upon how they're measured and which lakes are assessed and which are not assessed. So th these are conditions assessment from 2016 and 2018 for, in this case, lakes for fish consumption. Um, uh, 71% uh, not assessed, but of those uh, for, for fish consumption, 26% are not supporting. Uh, for lake recreation use, 52% not assessed. And this is in a two-year cycle, okay? So 52% not assessed in a two-year cycle, um, with 34% not uh, supporting. And then fish and aquatic life use, uh, 14% not assessed and 30% uh, not supporting. Uh, and and it, uh, in 2016, they, they did a little bit of uh, difference in the way they, they chunked the data together. So 35% and 21%, you add those together, that's equal to the fully supporting uh, down here in 2018 for fish and aquatic life use, okay? so. 35, 55, 56. So this is 56% basically supporting uh, in 2016 comparison to in 2018, 52%. So it's, a, it's about the same, okay? But there's, there's some differences here. So I just wanted to sh show you uh, those differences and how we're assessing whether the, uh, the, our lakes are meeting particular uh, designated uses that we've selected uh, as a society for what that lake should be good for, you know, what should we expect of it? And here, just uh, for those of you that are focused on impoundments, um, same kinds of charts, uh, you know, impoundments are different kinds of systems than natural lakes, so you can see here, uh, there's a lot more red, um, a lot more in the not supporting category for our impoundments, uh, for fish and aquatic life, recreation and fish consumption use um, in uh, both uh, the 2016 report uh, and the 20. Uh, 18 report. Okay, so now I'm going to try to translate that uh, use that condition assessment into uh, looking at the pollutants in those lakes um, and also uh, what we, we would call the, what that lake is impaired or why do we know that lake is impaired, okay? <coughs> so, so um, okay, again, focused on lakes for recreational use in this case, uh, the bulk of our lakes are, uh, the to total phosphorus is the most uh, common pollutant, okay? That's, that's resulting in imp an impairment. And the impairment itself that is most common is excess algal growth. So if we have um, a lot of phosphorus in a lake, that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that we're seeing it uh, have a negative impact on the, the designated use, okay? That I'm just looking around like, not, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so that, I'm, what, we're taking a measurement, phosphorus, we're looking at the impact that that phosphorus has on the designated use of the system, or what, what does that phosphorus look like you know, when it gets into the lake and says, oh, we have too much algal growth here, that's a problem, so we have an impairment. 
Uh, and similarly for impoundment for recreational use, total phosphorus, again, the big, the, um, the big elephant in the room, uh, and then excess algal growth, and also just general water quality use uh, for recreation. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not sure exactly what all goes into that other category, um, but it's other impairments uh, uh, that are resulting from phosphorus mostly. All right, so uh, lake, imp lake pollutant impairments uh, for uh, fish and aquatic life. Again, total phosphorus and then sediment and total suspended solids become an important measurement uh, when it comes to what our fish need and what other aquatic life needs to, to, um, to make use of that lake. Uh, and then there are a lot of other uh, impairments that come, uh, come into play here. So the results of this total phosphorus and sediment in the lake means uh, eutrophication uh, is considered a, a separate impairment from al excess algae growth, low dissolved oxygen, and then uh, turbidity is another uh, impairment or the, the uh, low level of lake clarity. Uh, and uh, impoundments for fish and aquatic life, again, total phosphorus, a big one, eutrophication, and low dissolved oxygen. So again, I'm just, uh, like, this is uh, maybe a summary of some of the, uh, I'm translating what the pollutant means that's coming from, mostly coming from the watershed. Uh, what does that mean in terms of an impairment, and how do we measure that uh, and, and come up with, a, like, yeah, your lake's doing great, or no, your lake's not doing so great. Uh, and I, wa I wanted to throw this in here, of course, because as Susan pointed out, you know, the, the water coming in comes not only from surface, but comes from groundwater for many of our lakes. And we are, uh, in addition to uh, pollutants coming into the system, water quantity uh, and the water that we are using as people also uh, has an impact on some of our lakes, right? So just... Uh, this is the latest uh, 2017 groundwater annual withdrawals. Um, so these are, these are groundwater annual withdrawals here and surface water annual withdrawals here. So just have a sense. There's a lot of straws that we're sticking into that water, um, and it does have an impact over time uh, on uh, the, our designated uses. OK. So uh, that's a little, now I'm going to get back into the, the watershed here. And again, so the, the, I'm going to talk a little. Okay, so we're this. These are the impact, some of the impacts that we're having on the water, but there are reasons that we're using the water, and we want to continue in the, to use the water. And there are reasons that we're using the land the way that we're using it, right? So agriculture is a big one. Um, and again, I, how many of you uh, get food from a, a local farmer or from your farmer's market? How many of you? Um, so you uh, and. How many of you have had something with corn in it, do you think, in the past? Yeah, right? OK. Um, soybeans, a little, best, a little harder to see. But we, we use these products all the time, right? We use uh, what, far, what our farmers are producing. And milk, how many of you have had ice cream, milk, sour cream, yogurt, yeah, cheese pizza, right? OK. So oops, uh, Wisconsin contributes over almost $90 billion to our economy, right, in our state. Um, we have uh, six, almost uh, over 68,000 farms, uh, covers over 14 million of our acres. Uh, uh, annual farm size, that's not quite as important for this conversation, but lots of jobs, uh, over 400,000 jobs. 11, almost 12% of the state's employment is in some way related to agriculture. Our dairy industry contributes over 40 billion to our economy, um, and we exported over three, uh, almost over three billion dollars um, to uh, around the world. Right. So this is a big, um, important component of who we are as, as Wisconsinites, and probably most of you know that um, with the way that dairy pricing works and the way that our economy is right now, we are in really an epidemic of losing uh, a lot of our smaller farms, a lot of our smaller dairy farms. So in, in 2018, uh, over 600 farms uh, were lost. That's more than um, 2013, which was the next biggest year. So there's, and, and those are 
you know, we can talk about big farms, small farms, and how that relates to what's happening in our lakes. Uh, but these are our neighbors. These are our families that are um, important to our communities and important to our local economies. Um, so this is this is a big uh, a big deal just for who we are as a state. Um, uh, you know, economic development, uh, water, a lot of uh, economic development is centered around our water resources. So again, it's, it's not just about our lakes, it's about our communities and about our ability to live here and have family supporting jobs. This is from Hillsboro and, you know, I was uh, looking at their economic development planning and how many of the pictures that they have in their summary of, hey, come here to Hillsboro was a worse centered around water. So um, there's a, a reciprocal relationship here that we want to be cognizant of and protect. And then, of course, uh, uh, water-based recreation in Wisconsin. And just some more stats for you here, too, from the latest uh, Wisconsin statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. Um, so, and we, so we look again at how much our, our, our water and the use of our water contributes to our economy and how many of the most popular activities, uh, I know that you can't really read all of that, but um, visiting a beach and walking, uh, bird, swimming in lakes and ponds and rivers, uh, motor boating, uh, canoeing and kayaking, and fishing is down here. Like many of these most popular of our outdoor activities are, are, are water-based. And now I'm pre preaching to the choir about this. But, um, and, and like Kate was saying this morning, we probably are under, you know, when we do this equation of, okay, uh, is it worth, you know, what we're putting into the water? Is it worth you know, what we're gonna get back out now and we're able to continue to get back out in the future. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit of evidence that we're not doing a great job at, at doing that cost-benefit analysis or, or do, balancing that equation about, you know, is it worth um, all that phosphorus that we're putting in or is it worth maybe paying a little bit more to keep that phosphorus out because we're gonna you know, we're going to get it back out the other end, right? Whether it's in recreation or, prop or property um, values or in public health um, uh, benefits uh, from surface water and, and groundwater as being cleaner. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, Eric wanted me to talk a little bit about how we assess uh, the health of our, our, our watersheds. Um, so, this is from the Wisconsin Integrated Assessment of Watershed Health. It's a 2014 publication. Um, uh, I know DNR is doing more to look at how we assess watershed health, and there's going to be some things coming out, I think, in the not too distant future. But this is, the, this is a good start. So if you look at this landscape condition and the measures here, percent natural cover, percent intact, active river area, meaning it's not isolated from its floodplain or from the shoreline, percent um, hubs and corridors, and percent wetland remaining. These are watershed, most of these are watershed related measures, right? This stream flow, oops, there you go. This stream flow eco change here, that sounds like a super technical term. It is a technical term, but it just is looking at how um, the hydrology of the, the, in this case, a stream, but it would call your lake has some uh, of these aspects as well, is changing over time, you know, through development, through uh, changes in weather and climate in more, you know, more extreme types of events. So this, um, th this, whoop, come on, there we go. So it's looking really at the hydrology of the watershed. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna, this habitat condition or geomorphology. So looking at the canals and ditches around the water body, uh, road crossing density, um, and, and then you know, is the uh, uh, area uh, dominated by reed canary grass and the impact that that will have. So again, these are just some examples of looking at the landscape and what's happening on the landscape that might impact uh, these other measures here, water quality, biological condition, um, and aquatic invasive species that were some of the things that Susan covered in more detail. Um, so in this publication, they, also, they, they scrunched all these numbers together into, into a model to look at uh, 
where the uh, the, where some of the most healthy and most vulnerable areas were and where some of the least vulnerable and uh, least healthy uh, areas of, of water were in the state. So um, just that's something you can take a look at and see uh, where your area falls based on some of these measures. Okay, so now, uh, how many of you were in Eric's presentation this morning, the, the 101 that he did? Okay, some of you. So I'm gonna, again, look at, so the, uh, a tool that's being used in this watershed that we're in right now, um, which is uh, the total maximum daily load, in this case for the Wisconsin River. A total maximum daily load establishes the maximum amount of a pollutant that's allowed to come into the water body um, that, that the idea is that you would expect that if only that amount was coming in, you would be able to maintain the designated uses of that water body, right? So it's setting uh, a pollutant diet for your lake or for uh, a river. Uh, and, and it also says, okay, so once you establish that, you know, how many calories, you know, how many phosphorus calories can the water body eat? Um, and then it says, okay, where can those calories come from? All right. So there's lots of different, there's lots of information that goes into these uh, uh, total maximum daily load calculations, but I'm just gonna give you a very brief uh, overview. So of course there's a lot of land use information that goes into it. Um, a, lot, a lot of different calculations go into it. But then uh, what they do is they, they can use a model uh, to look at where that load is coming from on the landscape. So how much of the phosphorus is coming from which of the sub-watersheds on the landscape? And again, you could do this for a small lake uh, or you can do it for a, a giant area like this, right? So, you, I mean, this tool is universal, but I'm just uh, giving you an example because this is where we are. So, uh, so w the most loading is coming in from the Bear Boo River here, down uh, toward the, the bottom part of this watershed, and, um, and particularly from these uh, water bodies in the west, or I'm sorry, these uh, sub-watersheds in the west. And then less, you know, is coming from the lighter areas here. So that means that, you know, you know we don't have enough money to do everything, right? So this, this helps us uh, figure out where uh, we could focus to get the most bang for our buck. And then on this chart, uh, it, it says, okay, so green is background. Basically, this is what we think would have been coming in regardless of, of the, the land uses that we have, um, just based on soils and uh, climate and other kinds of characteristics. Uh, the orange color is agriculture. The purplish blue color is urban. And then they specifically are calling out the yellow point sources, which are regulated sources of pollution. You know, those point sources, there's a regulatory structure that says this is exactly how much phosphorus you can put out of that pipe, right? With non-point sources like agriculture and these urban areas, there isn't, um, well, for the urban areas, but there, for the agricultural sources, there is not a specific number typically um, uh, so the TMDL tries to help assign a number to those agricultural areas, right? So, um, so we've got, okay, uh, oops, we've got about, you know, where on the landscape is this stuff coming from pretty much? And then for those parts on the landscape, like wh what is the uh, uh, portion of that landscape that, or the, um, how much is agriculture contributing? Or how much is urban stormwater contributing? So we know who, who's doing what. Okay, so point sources, you know, point sources can be like this cheese plant or it can be uh, a municipal uh, wastewater treatment plant, right? Just like anywhere you got a pipe and there's water coming out of that pipe and it's got stuff in that water, that's point source. Non-point source, uh, urban stormwater, so it's, uh, essentially polluted runoff coming off of urban landscapes into a storm sewer and then being released out into a lake or stream. And then if we've got agriculture, like I said, uh, again, running off of the land, there's not a pipe, 
Um, it's, it's, it's running, running off of the land and, and going into the water. Okay, so, all right, so we've got uh, where those pollution, pollutants are coming from, both the, the place on the landscape and the use. And then, um, it, Wisconsin is starting to get to this point, but in, in Iowa, they've done this really cool thing where you can go online and you can see uh, where existing practices are for agriculture in this case. So I'm gonna focus on agriculture because I think this is an interesting example. So, okay, how, how are we gonna get this job done, right? There's a lot of acreage there. There's a lot of phosphorus that's coming off of that landscape. How are we gonna get this done? And, and what I was done is they have mapped where all of their agricultural practices are currently in the state, and they're starting to map where, you know, if we put um, so many, uh, you know, if we put cover crops here, if we put uh, what they call water and sediment control basins, you know, um, uh, structures on the landscape that help keep that water pooled and draining more into the ground than off of, often into the water, uh, like uh, where they might need to put wetlands back in on the landscape by breaking tiles, um, just different kinds of practices that, oh, we, if we put these into place, then we would meet that, that phosphorus diet, you know, that we were talking about uh, for our water body. So um, here, you know, so they've got uh, saturated buffers in yellow. So that is, that, this is for nitrogen now. We, we were talking a little bit about nitrogen. Nitrogen is the big problem that they're working on in Iowa. So if you um, put water, instead of putting it right into the stream, if you run it through these saturated buffers, uh, it helps to take the nitrogen out of the water, basically. So they, they've mapped uh, where these practices could go, wetland buffers, wetland drainage areas, nitrate removal wetlands. Um, the, so I'm just, like you can see in yellow here, those are where the saturated buffers would go. Uh, here's this blue is nitrate removal wetlands. Um, here's another map, because you can't put them all in one map or it's hard to see, um, but that looks at uh, like all these green, like green areas or grassed waterways, for example. Most of you are familiar with those. If you're driving around in any place in topography in Wisconsin, you'll see a grassed waterway. Helps slow the water down, helps the sediment settle out, prevents that phosphorus that's tied to the sediment from getting into the water. Um, and again, just here, they, they, so you can see how they've done these maps to say, this is where we could put these practices on the landscape and get to our, our water goal. Okay. Um, so now I want to, okay, so the, this is very much uh, like a recipe, right, on the, on the land side, on the land management side. So who makes all these decisions? It's us, right? It's, pe it's, it's us, it's people. Um, so I, I want to just provide, like, what, what does successful watershed management mean? If you're working on a lake or working on a river, it's a, it's a system that achieves all of the different goals we need that watershed to provide, right? Environmental, social, and economic in a designated time frame, because I know it took us a long time to get here, you know, I mean, it took us 100 years at least to get us to where we are now in the state of our waters. If we can help it, we don't want it to take 100 years you know, to, to get to our goals. Um, within the goal, in uh, a time frame that is agreed upon by a representative group of stakeholders, and by representative, I mean broadly representative, like not just the people that think about water when they wake up every day, you know, but people that don't, that's not the lens that they're looking through necessarily, but we need to bring those folks into our, into our conversation. Um, an important part of doing this and being successful is managing expectations. So uh, in this chart, it's just pointing out the fact that we're, you know, we're, we're trying to set goals, but we're doing it in a system that's changing all the time. And Susan talked about climate. She talked about invasive species. So with these changes, you know, what, we, what we think is going to happen is we're going to have these management interventions that are going to keep getting more and more and more. And then the nutrient loading is going to get less and less and less, right? And precipitation is going to stay the same. Land use intensity is going to stay the same. Is that true? That precipitation and land use intensity are going to stay the same? Huh? No, that's not true. 
right? But that's kind of how we, that's how we think about it. Um, so what's, what's really happening is we're doing more management. Uh, precipitation is going up, land use intensity is going up, and our nutrient loading is staying the same. We feel like we're running in place, right? So it's, it's just important to lay out what's happening and to manage our expectations and say, if we're really going to get to our goals, you know, we got to we got to up our game a little bit because the system is changing and we have to be aware of that. Okay, because otherwise, <laughs> how many of you know somebody that does this, right, about the issues, like I do this on, <laughs> on various things, it's, uh, hopefully not about water, but you know, we all do this and some like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine, you know, this is a big job that we have. And then we fight with each other, right? We get mad and we, we, we don't listen, right? We don't listen to each other. We get into these, um, these really challenging conversations when really we have to figure out how to work together. We have to figure out how to, how to join hands and you know, figure out how to, how to get this done. So um, this is a complex issue, what we're doing in watersheds and in managing water resources. Uh, there's so many different from, from uh, Nash, you know, this is a, you know, a national global thing, but water, it, water is a global security issue in addition to being a local, um, a local issue. Uh, and it, it takes, uh, this is a, uh, this one U.S. Water Alliance is a great resource for you if you haven't seen it. But they, they have this one water approach that they're espousing. A lot of great resources, but it really is true. We, I mean, we have to uh, figure out how all of us are working together. Um, social change. Uh, I wanted to point out government versus governance. Right. We know that we cannot rely upon government to do everything. You are a living, breathing example of how important it is to have everybody involved in working on water. Not, it's not just about government. It's not just about regulation. It's about uh, community conversation, and it's about community stewardship uh, for water resources. And it, it, it takes the village. Um, so there, there's a publication that uh, we recently put out, the North Central Region Water Network, on how we go from small scale, uh, more isolated successes on our landscape to having broader coverage of successful water resource management. I just wanted to point this out. Um, that talks about some of the things that we need to do to build human capital or human capacity, build social capital or capacity, some policy framework ideas, and money. Like, there's a lot of conversation that's going on right now to rewire how the money works when it comes to water management. I'm not going to go into that today, but I wanted to just say there's a, there's a lot happening there to look at urban sources of funding, agricultural sources of funding, government sources of funding, um, private philanthropic um, impact investing or green, green investing. And I just encourage you to take a look at some of those tools because there are a lot of new tools and new resources that are available. Okay, and, and finally, just some, some resources for Wisconsin. This is just, this is places to start, right? I, thank you. Um, there are so many great resources that we have in Wisconsin. So I just wanted to give you a couple of you know, portals uh, in to information. Uh, some of you have heard the, about the Clean Lakes Alliance or heard them speak. Um, interesting uh, stuff going on down there in the Hara watershed. Also, uh, maybe in, some of you work with your farmer-led watershed groups. If you have a farmer-led watershed organization near where you are, uh, the Department of Ag, Trade, and S Consumer Protection is supporting these watershed, uh, these farmer-led watershed groups with some funding. Um, Yahara Pride uh, is one of them. So these two groups working together is an interesting uh, recipe for progress. So I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, county land and water departments and land and water resource management plans. Uh, all of all of your counties have one of those. It again, your county. And that plan is a good place to start if you haven't seen those. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have Wisconsin Land and Water, which is where our county conservation uh, departments uh, have their professional home. Uh, another great place for watershed-related information. 
the River Alliance of Wisconsin, uh, and uh, Gathering Waters, our, our colleagues at the Land Trust. I did not put Wisconsin Association of Lakes in here because I know you know them and you know where to find them. And of course, they're a great resource, but I wanted to give you some additional ones that are focused more on watershed management. University Extension, I'm gonna plow through these right now. Uh, of course, our Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and our Department of Ag. I put the, the links in here are specific to watershed resources, okay? So if you go back to this presentation, you'll find links that will not just get you to the home page, but it will get you to a page that is focused on water resources. Uh, our federal agencies, US EPA, uh, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and USGS, the geological survey that does a lot of monitoring for us, really important information, and again, these links are just so you can go and find more water and watershed related information from these agencies. And then finally, to end with another Leopold quote, this time from the elder, to keep every cog in wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And what I wanted to end with is that you are the most critical cogs and wheels in this system. You are the people that are going to be reaching out to your neighbors and to people that you do not know and do not have, have lakes at the top of mind and to open a conversation with them about the mutual benefits for managing lakes more effectively. So thank you so much for everything that you do and remember how important you are and go out and do your great work. So thank you. Where does the oil spot regarding the model, watershed model, uh, for your maximum daily load? Is that kind of a first step? And that kind of the question would be, uh, in our case, primarily the surface water comes in through a single ditch line. Would a more effective method be pulling samples uh, from the ditch line uh, during major rainfall events to get a feel for the phosphorus? Uh, coming to a major surface water source? Yeah, so it... Got a follow -up question after that. Oh, okay, whoa. So if I understood your question correctly, so uh, in not every case does it make sense to go through the big amount of work that it is to do a TMDL. It is a, it is a lot of work. So if you already know that, but, but you have to be careful about this no, you know, do you really know? Um, that there's a lot of phosphorus coming in from a particular source, then yeah, yeah. I mean, you can start with measuring uh, what's happening there at in that ditch. Um, but again, I would caution about the be, you know be careful about whether you actually know that or whether um, there's some question. And, and the, the follow-up on that: setting a goal for zero phosphorus going into the lake is a wonderful thing. What's a practical uh, level that, that you can, you know, cost benefit. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and you, you saw the background category in that slide. You know, there was always phosphorus coming into our lakes. So we, we wouldn't even want uh, to have a zero. Um, but the, the, something like a total maximum daily load or a phosphorus budget for the water body can help you. So at least, you, you know, you're, you're getting it down to what, um, what the level of phosphorus is that would support that designated use, right? So what we agree on is what we think the, the lake should be used for. And once we agree on what the lake should be used for, then there's a good amount of information for what amount of phosphorus uh, you know, do we need to get to to support that designated use. Okay. And then one where more. is most of it? What is, what is the breakdown of where it comes from, the phosphorus? The phosphorus. It's, it's uh, location dependent. Yeah. Yep, so if you saw in, uh, in, in those where does it come from charts in the TMDL for the Wisconsin River, in some cases, more of it is coming from agriculture. In some cases, more of it is coming from urban. In some cases, more of it is coming from background. It's just, you know, the percentage is larger. Um, so, and yes, yeah, so leaves can contribute, right. So it really is, it's location dependent. I know that's not a great answer, but thank you, everyone. Thanks,